Okay. Yeah, I am. I've got to try not to corpse. Um. <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome to Talk Solent, the show where we give our opinions on news that's cropped up this week in our region and beyond. I'm Jonathan Hines and joining us on the sofa today, giving us their thoughts and expertise, a broadcaster Mike Lyons and Holly Loveland. Now, we know the high street is changing and we are doing more and more things online now, of course. Two more branches of HSBC Bank on the Isle of Wight are set to close at the beginning of next year, leaving only two remaining. We have seen the same with some of our local small uh, post offices, of course. But let's ask our panellists today, Holly and Mike, if we choose to do more and more online, can we really complain about these closures? Can we really expect to have the best of both worlds? Welcome, great to have you on again, uh, Holly and Mike. Um, now, this is happening all the time, isn't it? Um, but obviously, at the same time, we're, we're doing more and more online. So, can we have the best of both worlds? Can we have it both ways? Well, these days, I don't think so. The only unfortunate thing about that is it's the generally the older generation that suffers the most because they're not into their computers. They're not used to using the internet. So they find all of that alien to them. Mm. And then when their local branch shuts, they're not even able to get to the nearest one. So even though yeah. there's some available, there's going to be a lot of people out there completely alienated from their bank now. Mm. So, just before we go on, in 2011, the Sandown one on the Isle of Wight closed, 2013, Freshwater, 2015, Ventnor, and now um, we've got Cowles and uh, Shanklin um, at the start of um, next year. Holly, I mean, Holly, I mean, do you mind if I ask, do, do, do you do online banking yourself? I mean, would you use your phone for banking or would you rather go into a branch? Personally, I'd rather go into a branch. I think it's easier. Um, right. Some, from time to time, I would use um, online banking, but I think it's a lot easier to go into a, a branch and do things over a desk or with, in front of someone who knows what they're talking about. Mm. And of course, the, the, the post offices are closing um, as well. I mean, Mike, do you think um, that it's a little bit unhealthy in some ways that we're doing more and more on a phone or on a computer as opposed to having face-to-face -face contact with somebody? In a way, yes, because we're losing how to form personal connections. Um, for this generation, it's not so bad. For the current children that are out there, like babies and children spending most of their time on tablet devices instead of interacting with people, it's going to stunt certain developments there. Mm. But I think with this, Internet banking is okay for checking your balance, transferring from one account to another. But there's lots of times when you still need to go into a bank to get stuff done. Like if you want to see someone about a personal loan or, you know, just to ask questions because you're unsure of the whole thing. But this just stinks of um, profiteering by the, by the banks. They're making millions and millions all the time. And yet, just because they're doing cost cutting in a way, they're just taking away the services from the people in the area. Yeah, of course, it's not just HSBC, but many banks are doing similar. Small branches closing, small um, sub uh, post offices. They've, they've apparently, um, in the last um, five years, they've seen a f an average of 40% um, reduction in footfall um, in the branches. That's just in five years, 40%. So that shows you how much mobile phones and, and the internet have exploded just in the past five years, doesn't it? Yeah. 40%. Um, but 93% uh, of contact with the bank is now completed via the telephone, internet or smart so smartphone. Plus 97% of cash withdrawals are made via an ATM. As you said, maybe some people, some of the over the 70s might do uh, the withdrawals over the counter. So it's, 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 it's like um, shopping as well. I mean, do you, do you buy things online? Yeah. Some things. Sometimes. 
but other things I still like to go in the shop for. Do you think you do more of it than you used to? Oh no, still about 50-50 in that one. Mm. Because that's, you know, that, that's another reason why a lot of the high street shop, independent shops are appearing and then disappearing, isn't it? I was going to say, the real problem with all this is something that never really gets mentioned. But it's always the case that the rents are just too high for the shops to keep open. So they have to spend more and more time working just to pay the rent and less time of actually making profits for themselves. And that's where the real danger lies. Mm. Mm. That's why the shops do get driven out from certain areas, because rents are higher than they should be. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, this is serious, but also a slightly humorous comment here uh, that was left. Um, this, this article here is from the... Um, uh, on the uh, on the white, um, which is obviously the um, Isle of Wight newspaper, and someone's left a comment here: "More wounds in our struggling high streets, but hey, look on the bright side. I am sure that these premises will be taken over by very rapidly by yet another estate agent, or perhaps yet another charity shop, or more excitingly, even than those, another uh, tattoo parlour." Someone's written here. <laughs> so, so, a charity shop tattoo parlour or uh, an estate agent. So um, then somebody else um, also wrote, um, there's another comment here. Uh, yeah, somebody else said that um, the high street is changing and um, if people are going to do things online, then they should uh, expect that the high street uh, to change. They can't have it both ways. Right, so that's uh, closure of H uh, two more HSBC on the Isle of Wight, and uh, of course other branches, other bank um, banks are doing the same. Now, moving on, a caution-based coach firm, Vision Travel, has apologised after one of its drivers stopped a coach full of school children for ten minutes to perform Muslim prayers on the side of the road. He stopped outside Portsmouth College in Eastern Road in a dangerous spot without warning to perform the Muslim prayers after a school trip to London. Vision Travel is looking into the incident, which has left many parents furious, especially as the coach was only two minutes from the school. The driver's behaviour has been condemned by Muslims locally as wrong and uh, unnecessary. Holly and Mike, a rather extraordinary story here. What was your initial reaction when you saw uh, this article? Ever seen anything like it before? No. Mike? Well, it's just completely shocking, isn't it? Um, you know, there's a certain care of duty of what you're doing, um, and it's just someone not really taking their job seriously. Mm. And no matter how, no matter how devout you were, surely um, you wouldn't need to do that or wouldn't want to do that, I'm thinking? Well, I get that. Where when you're a Muslim, there are certain prayers you've got to do five days, five times a day. But it even states that that is flexible in when you can do it. Yeah. And so to be in the middle of uh, taking kids home, and then just stop in a dangerous spot to do this, mm. it's not being aware of your environment properly. That's right. It was ten minutes, and it was uh, without uh, warning. And of course, parents are um, furious. Um, but a city councillor and practicing Muslim councillor, Yahya Chowdhury, was shocked by the driver's actions. He explained the time of daily prayer was flexible, as you've just said, Mike, uh, for individuals unable to join in communal service at a mosque. He said, it's sad what he has done. If he is doing a job like that, then he should care for the children first and make sure the children are safe um, before he goes to um, pray. And apparently, according to this article, he was only only two minutes from the school. Um, Makes it even worse. Yeah. So it would have taken uh, just two minutes, and uh, uh, so the company has launched a probe um, into the incident. There were some 50 children uh, on the coach um, as well. And this happened at Eastern Road, uh, opposite um, Portsmouth um, College. It's an extraordinary one. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, well, I mean, it's most Muslims w seem to be saying this is just gratuitous, it's unnecessary. Yeah. And uh, another 
Um, so just to mention, it was the Mion Junior School uh, in uh, South Sea. And uh, if you were a parent, Holly, would that be... Uh, would, how, how would you feel about that? What, would you, what do you think should happen to somebody like him? Do you think he should um, lose his licence for a year or, 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 or longer? Yeah, I reckon he should lose his job because if that was, my kid was on that um, coach, then, you know, my kid could be in danger. And they might not know it and, you know, I don't want anything to happen. I don't think he should be allowed to drive, like, drive a coach full of kids if he's mm. going to do something like that. Well, apparently a lot of cars were, were swerving to avoid uh, the coach. All it would have taken was for a big lorry to come flying around the corner and hit, and that would have been very serious. There could have been um, fatalities. And um, these, these were younger uh, children as well. So, um, And as the comment that was made by Councillor Chowdhury here, this isn't about his religion. He shouldn't um, have done it. So, yeah. So we've got. Um, if you want to let us know stories that we can be uh, talking about, then do email us on talk at that .com or tweet us using the hashtag talk solo. Coming up, we'll be talking Judy Dench on the Isle of Wight and a very controversial subject which was discussed at a meeting in Newport on the island this week. Back with you again very shortly after this. What, about a minute? Got it. Well, your answer was just like one word response. Welcome back to Talk Solent, the chat show where we share our regional views of news catching our eye and some national and international too. Joining me on the sofa today are Mike Lyons and Holly Loveland. Now, you may be aware that Judy Dench herself has recently been on the Isle of Wight at Osborne House for the filming of the new movie Victoria and Abdul, in which Judy is playing Queen Victoria herself. More about a humorous encounter two Isle of Wight residents had with Judy in a moment. But now, what's been your favourite portrayal by an actor? of a famous personality in a film, and who's done a good job of playing a famous personality? Holly, I know you uh, love your films. Is this a film mm -hmm. that you might like to see? Uh, mm. Queen Victoria and Abdul? Uh, no, I don't know. I'd, I'd see, my, my mum's a bit different, but I don't like all these old, like, old fashioned, like, films. I, I just, because I don't understand it. I think mm. that's just it. Um, personally, probably not, because I'd probably just sit there like, what's going on the whole time? Mm. And uh, what about yourself, Mike? Well, it's not exactly my cup of tea as far as films go. But I understand that the more films that are made about historical events, the more it will get people into history. And I think history is a good subject for anyone to know, really. Because mm. the old adage goes, um, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Mm. Mm. Has there, have there been any films, um, Holly and Mike, where, you know, a very famous person, you know, for example, Helen Mirren has played, um, has play, obviously played the Queen, and various actors have, have played very, very prominent people from, from history, and uh, are, there, are there any that you've particularly uh, liked that you can think of at the top of your head? Um, I know it's not a real famous person in that respect, but um, A Beautiful Mind. Yes. That was a true story. And I think that was played really well. Yes. Even though it was slightly historically inaccurate. A Beautiful Mind, was that, was that one of your types of films, um, Holly? I was going to say Tom Hardy playing the Cray Twins. That's got I saw one. that one. Yes, yeah, I don't see many one. films. And I, yeah. There's the old one with the Spando Ballet. I think mean, twins, yeah, they're actually twins in real life. And then there's the one where it's just Tom Hardy playing both of them. I do like that. I think he played that really well. 
Yeah, I saw that a year ago. Mm. I, I don't get to see many films. I'd like to see more, and I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. Well, just to get this, before we go any further, just to get this one into context, um, the historic former palace's interiors, that's Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, will feature as the backdrop for several significant scenes in the film directed by Stephen Frears. Osborne House is the only one of the monarch's homes to be used as a film location. And uh, Judy Dench is obviously playing Victoria, and the film Victoria and Abdul charts the extraordinary true story of an unexpected friendship in the later years of Queen Victoria's rules, rule. Abdul Karim uh, was a young clerk who travelled from India to participate in, the Victoria, in Victoria's Golden Jubilee celebrations, and uh, he got on very well um, with the Queen. So, um, a couple of people from the Isle of Wight had, a, had an encounter with uh, Judy Dench. They were invited to visit the location and meet the cast and production team. And this is in a letter in the Isle of Wight County Press. And um, they were introduced to Dame Judy. And that's uh, John and Anne Langley from Newport. And um, sh apparently they, uh, they, they took Judy Dench's hand and said, Hello, Your Majesty. With a wicked grin, she looked straight through um, uh, Anne and John and said imperiously, and, and, and imp I'm going to fluff the punchline now, aren't I? <laughs> so, I've been, had a bit of a cold this week. Uh, with a wicked grin, she looked straight through me and imperiously commanded me, Neil. I corrected her by saying, no, it's, it's John, not Neil. She lost the grin and burst out laughing. <laughs> At last, Queen Victoria had been well and truly amused. So that was a, um, from a letter by John and Anne, John and Anne Langley of um, uh, Newport. So, uh, what films uh, are coming up then that you that you're interested? Obviously, the Star Wars one is um, there's another Star Wars one coming up soon, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I think it's Rogue One. Um, mm, can't think of any on the spot at the moment. What have you seen recently? Or? I've been probably a lot on, more than I have. I've been watching older films. I watched Brokeback Mountain the other day. Yes, I have seen that one. Um, yeah. Very sad ending. Mm -hmm. I was heartbroken at the ending. Um, oh, were you? Yeah. Because I'm watching older films I haven't actually seen. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of going back in time watching older films instead of newer ones. But, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. And what have you been looking at recently, Mike? Um, well, I'm really excited for the new uh, Doctor Strange film to come out. Say again? Doctor Strange. Right. Yeah. Um, part of the Marvel Universe, introducing magic in that sense. Tell us more. Um, so, well, I don't really know too much about Doctor Strange, that's why I'm looking forward to watching the film. Mm. Um, but he's uh, originally a surgeon, he saves people lives with his hands. Right. He gets into an accident where his hands are completely disfigured. And finding out that the medical industry just can't do anything to repair his hands, he goes into a search into, um, I think it's, oh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Um, Mongolia type areas to look yeah. for more mystic ways to sort out his problems. Um, finding like a, a Buddhist temple type thing, mm -hmm. and he goes through certain training there where he recovers the use of his hands, but beyond that, starts to get into magic and stuff like that. And then obviously, all hell breaks loose because you've got to have a film with some action in it. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Right, uh, so uh, let's move on to something a bit more uh, serious. The issue of uh, assisted dying for the terminally ill was discussed at a meeting held in Newport last Thursday by pressure group Dignity in Dying. A bill to legalise assisted dying failed in the Commons last year despite 82% of the public favouring this legal right for a person to plan their own death. Isle of Wight MP Andrew Turner opposed the bill. Let's ask our panellists, Mike and Holly, is it absurd that despite some 80% or more of the public supporting this bill, people still have to travel to Dignitas in Switzerland to end their own lives. It does seem odd, doesn't it? It does seem absurd that people should have to travel to a country, and not a far away country, but another European country, to, to do this when most people in this country want them to have the, the right or the ability to do it I have here to themselves. I find this one a very, very controversial and very touchy subject. Where, on one hand, I think everyone should have the, the right to make their own choices. But at the same time, as soon as you legalise death in that sense, 
what stops doctors convincing the older generation that you're costing the NHS too much, sign here and we can legally end it sort of thing. So there is a lot to do with that. You know, so I think if it's not handled correctly, there is a potential for misuse. Mm. So it's the sort of thing like, if you do want to choose that route, you should then have to see a psychologist to really, you know, find out if that's the best route for you or if there's another route to solve your problems. So it should be partly legalised then for certain cases, a case-by-case -case yeah. analysis. Because, like, if someone's like, right, my situation's terrible, I just want to end it, I can't do it myself because I'm just too paralysed, um, then they should, you know have proper help in that sense of is there another route before the final one is chosen because most people that have wanted um wanted to uh to just to die or to be able to die or be helped to die are people where um it's been confirmed that there's definitely not going to be any improvement or any cure or, or any enhancement in their quality of life well this is the thing the future is always uncertain so one day that may be the case, but a scientific discovery around the corner could change things. Very good point. Holly, do you think this could go, if they legalise it, um, do you think it could uh, just go a bit too far? Do you think people could be using it, you know, willy-nilly and, um, and it wouldn't just be the more, you know, the terminally ill, but other people as well that might decide that they, they should have the right to, and it might just go get a bit too much? Yeah, it could go out of hand. I think very depressed, clinically depressed people might consider it and they think, oh, well, I'm not going to get in trouble because it's legal, so I can go ahead and do it. Um, I think it should, yeah, should be for someone who has no hope and, you know, there is no, you know there's no cure for something they've got. They might be terminally ill. Uh, they might have a horrible disability that there's no way out of. It can't be fixed. Um, but I don't think it should be like legal for everyone to just, you know, do it willy nilly. I don't think that shouldn't be a thing. And do you think it should? This should be just for maybe the terminally ill who um, have um, very little quality of life and who've lost most of the ability to do most of the things they used to do before. Yeah, I think this just be for the, those people who have who can't do anything to do to help themselves. Mm. they not like said really bad disability or really ill and there's no cure for whatever they've got then yeah by all means but I think it should be a last resort definitely if you can look into another um, solution then yeah but if there's no nothing else then yeah. Mm. So really in essence um, you're neither for or against you know you're some, somewhere in the middle. Yeah I'm a bit in the case. middle yeah. I'm certainly coming from that one. And for you, my yeah. case by case basis. Yeah, mm. it really is. Like, the way I reckon it should be handled if it does get in is like, right, you make your, your plea case that look, you want to go that way. And then there's almost like a certain period of time that you have to go past before you get another meeting where it's like, right, do you still want to do that route? And, you know, you've got to have time to think about this because there's no taking that choice back. Mm. Uh, one of the group's spokesmen, uh, Paul St. John Martin, said he's very passionate about the need for change with regard to the terminally ill uh, and how they're treated in this country as a result of a recent death um, in his own family. Um, but, but one point that, st that struck me, 82% of the public, well, approximately, that can obviously fluctuate, favour a bill, um, and yet um, it hasn't gone through, but in, say, somewhere like Switzerland, it is perfectly legal. Interesting, isn't it? And I'm sure uh, we'll come back uh, to that one. If you've got news uh, that we should be talking about, then do contact us on our email, talk .com, or send us a tweet using hashtag TalkSolon. Back with you again very shortly for more discussion and banter.
Welcome back to Talk Sun. And joining me on the surface today are broadcaster Mike Lyons and Holly Loveland, another talk regular. All things children in this part of talk, uh, with the explosion in computers and uh, mobile technology and the internet, of course, children are not enjoying as much of the outdoors as they were a generation ago. And we often hear people say that children don't have as much contact with nature now. And of course, there's the obesity issue as well. Well, some good news. Uh, the first wild play site is to open next year in the New Forest near Holbury, where there'll be a variety of activities taking place for parents and children. So are initiatives like this really going to mean children will spend less time on their phones and computers? Or is this just a nice idea? Mike, so you're bursting uh, to uh, comment on uh, this one. Well, I really do hope it does work. Because mm. I think children should spend more time outdoors, and especially in the New Forest. A fantastic carry to have a good run around the place. Mm. Holly, what was your reaction? How did you feel about this? Uh, just a nice idea or, or something quite revolutionary that's going to have a big impact? I think it's a good idea. I think I'd go there myself. Yeah, yeah. it's a very good idea. Um, we yeah, need some like more, we need, <laughs> we need some more like uh, play areas, wildlife ones like that, something like that. Just I think a lot of little kids, the younger ones obviously, will want to go and do something like that, maybe might get them off their phones, it might work. Yeah, uh, a lady I was talking to, actually, funny enough, when I was in France a couple of weeks ago, uh, she said um, that, you know, in the summer, uh, they live in quite a nice area, and she's hot and sunny, and she said the kids were on the sofa, you know, on their tablets and phones, and she said, it's just ridiculous, I'm not having it, you know. I mean, no, you know, no one's saying you have to be out in the sun all the time, just because it's sunny, but she just thought, you know, it's just not I have on. to admit, though, I was most probably the same growing up um, <laughs> on my little PlayStation back in the day. That's what we had then, yeah. But, you know, then you kind of like, you do want to spend more time outside. So, yeah, the phones are more prevalent these days, but we found an excuse, whatever it was throughout the generation, some sort of technology. Yeah. It's all very well for people, you know, who are 30 plus to complain about these things. But if they were children or teenagers right now, then they'd be doing the same thing. Yeah. So, what can what will be there then? Uh, there's den building, balancing on logs, or tracing animal tracks. Woods, a wonderful place for children to explore the great doors, the great outdoors. Now, look at this statistic: uh, the number of children playing in wild spaces has more than halved in a generation, with only 10% playing in natural spaces such as woodlands and um, heaths. Now, this is the Holbury Manor Park and Warren Copse Wild Play Site, just outside. Holbury, and in terms of the funding and um, where the supporters come from, it's supported by a multi-million pound landscape partnership scheme called Our Past, Our Future, which is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and led by the New Forest uh, National Park Authority with uh, 10 key partners. And any logs and vegetation produced by the practical work this autumn will be recycled and used in the wild play site. Is it realistic, though, to, you know, obviously there's, we can only get children spending a little bit less time on mobile phones and tablets and so on, because it's, that's the way things are now. But if we can just reduce it, you know, obviously we can't stop it because it's, the, it's life now. But if we can just reduce it. I think the major problem is, yeah, they'll build it, but it's about getting there. Because you say about the number of children has halved in just a generation. That's because more and people are living in the cities, less people are living in the countryside areas, so you've got less children that can actually access that. Mm. And with the busy lives these days, it's not like the, the parents can always take them out to these places to, to play in the woods. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's a fanti fantastic idea to get it built. I want to go there myself, like you said. But the number of children going there will generally be just the ones that can get there locally. I remember the excitement of, of, you know, making a den and then going back to the den, um, you know, at the local, you know, woodland fields, whatever, and um, the excitement of going to see if it was still there and, yeah. you know, and do, do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I've forgotten all about that, you know, yeah. that thrill of, of having a den or, or tree, well, tree houses are a bit more ambitious, mm. aren't they? I don't know how many people actually had those, but um, <laughs> certainly dens, I remember those. I'm, I'm, I can't even remember quite what, what we used, you know. That's just the thing. whatever you, you were could kids, find. You just used everything, anything and everything. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that would, um, you're in your early 20s now, Holly, but that would mm -hmm. be something that would appeal to you as well now. Yep. Excellent. Yep, together. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll see more of those um, in other parts of the UK as well. So let's move on now. Uh, this is a school item. What about if school days were just a little bit longer, but holidays a bit longer too? Will children learn more and better if school days are just a little bit longer? Well, these are controversial proposals being put to parents and families of children at two new forest schools near Southampton. We'll look more at the details and ideas behind these proposals in a few minutes. So, would an extra 25 minutes in the school day improve pupils' performance or have a detrimental impact? Holly, how would you feel about this? Do you think um, an extra 25 minutes a day would make any difference, good or bad? Uh, to uh, children's performance and their confidence and um, their learning? Um, someone, I, I'm, I kind of have like, I think the longer I do things, you know, I lose, I kind of lose concentration. So I do think um, an extra 25 minutes or at making lessons just that bit longer might, they might tune off and they might not take it all in. I reckon, I, where did I see it? I think I saw a film on it or a video about um, a school starting like an hour or so later um, and then ending a bit earlier and then that means they're fully concentrated, they're more awake and they're ready to start the day and I think that's a better idea to have a later day and then maybe a little bit shorter. Oh right, so s start a little bit later. Yeah, I heard the success rate is a bit higher so it seems to have worked. Mm, okay. And, and so, and so sometimes concentration was something you you did you struggle with at school. Mm, staying yeah. concentrated for a long period of time. Mm. Uh, by the end of it, I've yeah, I've lost it. I've tuned out, and it's sometimes I don't take it all in. Do you think if that was balanced with longer holidays, that might have made it seem less less uh, daunting and less boring? Because that's what they're they're, they're proposing um, an extra an extra twenty five minutes in the day and extend the May and October half-term breaks by one week. Um, but there has been a lot of opposition from unions and um, from parents who have said, you know, limited concentration spans uh, are a problem, and therefore a lot of children are unlikely to benefit um, from more time at school. Mike, have you heard anything about this before, or was this uh, new to you when, you when you saw this particular article? Well, I have to admit, I've done a lot of research into the psychology of, you know, alertness, you know, being able to concentrate, um, and like you were saying, there was a documentary I watched one time about the whole, we've got an entire schooling system wrong. It's set up more, uh, you know, just to kind of like pass tests than it is to actually um, learn the information. Like, um, like the whole thing about bite size, is a way of like doing small sections of learning and not mm. even doing a full hour straight because even that's too much. Um, so everything in our schooling system is a bit wrong and the way I see it that is just trying to mess it up even more for the chance of a, a cheaper holiday for the extra, the extra two weeks that you That's what they were talking about. They, they said it gives parents the opportunity to have more, um, more food, um, sorry, more um, holiday holiday flexibility, so therefore cheaper. Um, so they've got more time in the summer holidays, so they might be able to get that, that cheaper holiday and therefore not take time off in term time. And what I thought was interesting, I didn't realise this, a Department for Education spokesman said academies had the freedom to shorten or lengthen school days and terms as they thought saw fit. I didn't know that. Not did I, but mm. it worrisome. Because then each school can do whatever it wants. Mm, mm. And how do you think the school, how, what, you know, what's your main concern about the way the, the school system is in this country then? Um, it's too rigid, almost mm. too structured in a way. Um, like it's set up nine o'clock starts and that's generally mm. the time parents are getting to work as well. Mm. So um, they complain about the amount of cars that are going to be parked outside of schools dropping kids off. But actually the school started later and the parents were already at work, then that actually almost eliminates that dropping off. So it's solving two problems with one stone, but because they're too kind of like, well, we've always done it that way, they won't change it. Mm. And let's face it, uh, secondary school, from not so much primary and junior school, but secondary school,
for many teenagers is a, is a dreadful experience, isn't it? Yeah. It's well, awful. They say that because of the way the brain is changing over that period of your, your teenage years, that you're actually set up <coughs> waking up later. So they say that for um, teenagers, schools shouldn't start until about half ten, eleven o'clock, because that's the prime time for their brain to be alert. And any time before that, they're still in a tired mode where they just can't concentrate. Well, some would argue we should be encouraging more study and, and helping children to study better at home. And so, so, so school should be less time at school and more uh, study at home because maybe, you know, they work better at home than in a class environment, some people argue, don't they? Well, actually, it works out we learn better if we're always playing rather than, like, serious study. Because the more you play with the information, the more it um, lodges in your brain. Mm. Holly, did you have something to add there? You don't have to, you're not obliged. I was just going to say, teenage, I've heard teenagers need eight hours sleep, so going along with the whole, our teenagers should start a bit later, I think that works better too. They'll have longer sleep, they'll be more alert when they do get to school. Um, so I think it would help if it was a bit later and they got their eight hours and they were just, I think it would mm. improve their um, success rate and all that, yeah. Mm. Right, interesting. And that article refers to Fawley Infant and Blackfield Primary uh, Schools uh, near Southampton. We didn't mention um, what schools we were talking about there. Uh, coming up, uh, we'll be sharing an article from the international press, Catching Our Eye. And if you've got news that we should be talking about, then do contact us on our email, talk at thatsolent.com, or send us a tweet on Twitter, hashtag TalkSolent. Hello, you're watching Talk Solent, and with me today on the sofa are Holly Loveland and Mike Lyons. For this final part of talk, uh, we've got uh, an item uh, from the international press in a few moments on technology, and it's a positive uh, item uh, as well, uh, all about uh, technology and mental and emotional well-being. Before that, um, Holly, um, you've got some, something to tell us about some fundraising um, that your uh, family has been involved in and actually you've just drawn my attention to the t-shirt um, you're wearing Hope for Sarah yeah uh, and that's can you just tell us more about that Sarah is my mother my right. mum um, she's severely disabled um, she's got MS primary progressive or so on and um, she's planning on going to another country to get um, something called HFCT which is um, well, it's got like a long name, but I don't really know it all. But basically, it's stem cell <laughs> research, and it's kind of like a it's quite brutal. It's like chemo, and yeah. she'll have to go away for a while and get like this huge operation. But it's fingers crossed, and she's hoping it will. Um, it will help her walk again, help her be a mother and stuff. And at the moment, we're trying because she's got to raise a lot of money. I think it's about fifty thousand at the moment. Mm. Um, she's probably on about. 13, maybe 14,000, she's doing all right. But 
li well, this weekend gone, I was away, but I missed it. But um, all her friends are organising um, events, and she did um, something called, I think it's called Custard Flinging or something. Cust I don't really know what it's called, but it's like... We, custard it, Flinging? Right. Well, I say flinging, Sounds custard, messy. kind of pouring custard on yourself. You sit in a pool oh. and you pour custard on yourself. Delicious. So um, we did it in a... Well, they, I say we did it. <laughs> I wasn't there. I was away. But um, you did it in a... Kind of like in our Tesco near ours, um, Fleet's Bridge Tesco. If I don't uh, yeah, you're, you live near Poole, don't you, in Dorset? Yeah. You're not too oh, far yeah, away. Oh, yeah, I'm from Poole, so yeah, not from not there. Too far but, away. Um, and people were coming by, watching, and there was just a big pool, and we were all sit, taking turns sitting in it, putting custard on ourselves for raise raised money. And then later on that night, it was the same day, I think it was the Saturday, there was like a Zumba event, and people were doing Zumba and raising money for that as well. Do you think she got about 1,300 for that? So that was in one day. That was pretty impressive. Really? She's um, done well then, hasn't she? But she, I mean, we've got events. We've got an auction on the 29th. Um, and there's like event, uh, companies and local businesses donating uh, vouchers and bits and bobs. So if you like a raffle and then you, if you say you win it, you, you win the prize or whatever. And so how long has your mum been, been very ill like she is now? How Seven. long has she been incapacitated? Um, well, it's progressed. she is now. It's progressed very, very quickly, um, seven years altogether, but since she's been really bad, probably about four, maybe coming up for five now, um, but it's just getting worse, and she's, um, mm. she was at one point, uh, talking, about, talking, about, talking about earlier, she was actually contemplating Dignitas, and mm. going over there and going through it, but luckily, right. um, she's decided to try this out, and she's going for it, and we're doing everything we can to help, and that's about it. So, fingers crossed, she gets the treatment she deserves. And so, this is hope for Sarah. Is there a website, yep. or um, or could people just go on to uh, Facebook? Um, she has. Well, she always writes everything on her Facebook, but she has a. Um, it's called a PayPal Me, and um, it's kind of like um, like a donation page, and you can pay money in, and it goes towards the treatment. Um, so, which ca and which country PayPal. will she be going to? Has that been ascertained? Uh, She's. Yet? Thinking is this a European of what was it country? called? Philippines, but she's looking around to see if there's any others. She was looking at India the other day. Um, but obviously, she can't do it here because um, it's something to do with something called the EDSS score. It's like how bad she is, really. It's um, an eight, so that's quite bad. And um, they don't do it for any more than about six, so she's got to go elsewhere. Hence why it's so expensive and it's so. You know, but she's doing everything she can to get to we get to the treatment she wants. So, yeah, it's all going very well at the moment. Mm. Keeping a positive uh, outlook on things. It's quite a bit of money, yeah. isn't it, so far? Mm. Mm. Yeah, she's done really well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. And there's some merchandise as well. Yeah, we have these made. <laughs> um, well, because I, I didn't go, I had to get a t-shirt. But yeah, this is the t-shirts that we kind of wore at the uh, custard thing the other day. So yeah. Mm. You'll, you'll keep us updated because you're a regular on mm -hmm. talk, so you can tell yeah, us more we'll do. as things um, pan out. Uh, thanks, Holly. So for this final part of talk, so we we're going to talk about uh, technology. Now, Mike Lyons with us now knows a fair bit about technology. Now, technology and mental and emotional well-being. This item from TechCrunch is talking about technology and mental and emotional health from a positive viewpoint. You may already be aware that your phone or computer knows more about you and what makes you tick than your mum or your spouse. It knows what you look for, for how long, and what you're interested in. But can the use of technology really contribute positively to our mental well-being? Mike, what's your expert assessment of this article here? Now, I know the, the article is it's a, just an introduction, isn't it? It's not, yeah. It uh, doesn't go into any depth. So it's basically just trying to say that the more technology tracks you, tracks your heart rate, tracks your sleep well-being, all of these sorts of details, the, the better they can technically look after you. The only problem is there's no guarantee that they can then look after you properly because they're still saying we just need more data. So it's quite a, an early stage statement in that sense. Mm. Because, um, you know, it's talking about, you know, I mean, the, the article starts by saying, Ask yourself a simple question. If it were an issue for you, what would you pay to get rid of stress, anxiety, loneliness, 
sadness, physical and mental pain or depression? Or conversely, what would you pay to be happy, feel connected, feel understood, change bad habits into better ones, have a healthy brain as you age, or to fulfill uh, your full potential and uh, really thrive? I mean, is it an exaggeration to say that your computer or your mobile knows more about you than your spouse or your mum? Um, not far off. I mean, really? the fact is, there's so much data gathering these days that even if you try to hide from it, there's still ways that they can figure out on a good percentage that it's still you using the computer sort of thing. So, like, for everything that you've done on Google with your Google account, is tracked and logged in Google. I mean, put it this way, Facebook has two different accounts for each person. One that is your public account, it's you, you've made it, and there's a, a secret one that they'll track everything that you do and how you interact. And the fact is, you don't even have to have a Facebook account for them to have one for you, because they'll you know, use other data to essentially summarize you. And it's this data that's being traded on a daily basis between companies, all for advertising purposes normally. But I can just see the, the negative side effect of this almost, that they're going to get all this personal data about you, about your heart rate, about your stress levels. Your heart rate? Yeah, like... You so is, it, is, is this happening on an everyday level now? Not at an everyday level. It's all to do with the new smartwatch craze. So these... Smartwatches, yeah, right. Yeah, so smartwatches, Fitbits... They can all track your heart rate, find out your stress levels. Um, so people are doing this for healthy reasons, think like if you're looking after it for yourself. But at the same time, other companies could collect this data and use it how they want to. Like you can get stopped getting a job because you know you can't deal with the stress of the job. Now, Mike, you're you're saying that uh, there's no way that you can avoid um, this information being gathered about you. There's no way you can hide. People have obviously tried to devise ways or tried to conceal or, or to maintain more privacy. Um, there are still ways, obviously, but they're becoming harder and harder to do because, you know, it's always an evolution game where one side is trying to get that data and another side doesn't want you to get that data. And, you know, it's a, a simple evolution pattern that happens anywhere. Mm. I mean, it's not too sophisticated and high-tech. Um, you know, when you're talking about how... When you go on YouTube or Facebook, things pop up um, in front of you that um, the computer thinks or the, the website thinks that you'll be interested in because all it's done is just observed what you've looked at or who you've looked at exactly. before. So that's not terribly sinister or sophisticated, but it can get more detailed than that, can't it? It all depends on how a company wants to use the data. And that's the big problem, really, is there's no guidelines on how this data can be used. I mean, at the end of the day, if companies buy it, they can use it how they want. Mm. And that's the real problem. There's no oversight. Mm. And we talk, we talk about Holly, we talk a lot about how, how technology is the negative side of technology and our mental and emotional well-being. But surely, you know, do, there, there are posit there's a positive side as well, isn't there? Technology can surely be good uh, for people as well emotionally. I mean, your mum, for example, look what... Technology is allowing her to do mm. in a way that she wouldn't have been able to do 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've had lots of positive feedback, and she's using Facebook and other websites to get people to, you know, donate and support. And yeah, it's, we've had very positive um, like outcome from everything. Um, mm. So that yeah, there is positives. Networking, um, you know, getting contacts that for stuff that could help you maybe in later life or mm. could help you get some sort of obviously people knowing people they're seeing my mum's posts and taking part and that's because everyone's sharing it everyone's saying stuff by word of mouth and it's getting out there and that's that's a positive thing people are starting to notice what's going on the internet i suppose in essence can be used for great good it can be used mm. for great um evil as well can't exactly mm. technology is just a tool and it all Neutral. depends how you use it Neutral, yeah. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time towards. All we've got time for today. Never enough time. My very many thanks to Mike and to Holly, um, who we'll be seeing again soon. I'm very sure. Uh, Talk Senate returns next week at the same time. All the best. Have a good evening. <laughs>